Hi, everyone. This is Bill Gibbs. I'll be your host today. It is just a pleasure to have you join us. Uh, this is the CapTech Talks. Uh, we offer these live. We also uh, offer them on demand, and uh, the on demand recording will be available in just a day or so. We're very, very pleased to have you join us today for our presentation by Dr. Richard Baker how UASs are being used during the COVID-19 pandemic and emerging technology update. I think you really enjoy this. I've been enjoying working with Dr. Baker, an, an expert in the field of UASs that have been involved with aviation for a long time. And I think as we, when I introduce him uh, to you, you'll see his credentials are um, wonderful and a great uh, presentation is in front of us. Let's talk just a little bit about the agenda that we'll be following today. Uh, just a a uh, little bit about capital. Many of you joining us today are extremely familiar with capital, maybe students, faculty, or staff. Others are familiar just simply because you um, attended in the past. But uh, whether you have a lot of knowledge or not, I'd like to talk just a little bit about it. Then we'll talk about the housekeeping, the session pointers. I'll introduce the presenter and then we'll get right into the presentation. The bulk of our time together is the presentation. Following the presentation, uh, you'll have a chance to have a question and answer period, and we'll talk about upcoming uh, webinars and also how to get a copy of the recording and a certificate of completion for this session. Just a little bit about capital, and again, many of you are quite familiar with our uh, wonderful university, but in case you're not, we're a nonprofit, private accredited university physically based in Laurel, Maryland, which is just a little bit outside of Washington, D.C., between D.C. and Baltimore. We've been around for a long, long time, established in 1927, and technology has always been our business. Uh, the type of training and education that we've provided has changed a little bit from our first days, obviously. Uh, who could have imagined uh, in 1927 um, uh, cybersecurity, for example? But we're always concerned with the technological end of things. We're accredited, fully accredited by the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. We're also recognized by the state of Maryland and authorized to confer degrees all the way from associate or two-year degrees right up to uh, doctoral degrees. And in fact, I want to invite anybody to who would like to learn more about our master's or doctoral programs to sit in on one of our sessions, uh, information sessions that will be held virtually on Sunday. If you're interested in one of those, just simply go to our website, captechu.edu. Now, here's a few session pointers. We'll answer questions at the end of the presentation and the way that you can do the questions is to type them into the text chat just as you did when you were indicating where you were from and we'll answer the questions as they come up but uh, at the end of the presentation in the order that they were asked. Uh, webcams and microphones are not being enabled for this session uh, so uh, just sit tight and communicate with us through the text chat. A link to the recording and the slides will be sent to you following the presentation and we'll also let you know how to receive a participation certificate if you wish one. We'll send those to anybody who asked to see it or asked to have it, whether they watch it live today or on demand. The presentation today is how UASs are being used during the COVID-19 pandemic and is presented by Dr. Richard Baker. Let me introduce Dr. Baker to you. Uh, it, he, uh, he and I have uh, known each other and worked together now for several years and I've always been impressed with his skills in the area of um, aviation and in UASs. Uh, Dr. Richard Baker, and I'll read this for you. Uh, Dr. Richard Baker is Director of Master's Programs here at Capital Technology University. He previously served as an Associate Professor in Indiana State University's Department of Aviation Technology and was also Executive Director of the Center for Unmanned Systems and Human Capital Development. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Mathematics and a Master of Science degree in Computer Science from Indiana State University. He received his doctorate in information systems from Nova Southeastern University. Before entering the academic world, he was the chief consulting uh, systems engineer for electronic data systems and General Motors. After leaving EDS, um, Richard served as the director of human factors and safety for American Airlines. 
Uh, and if that were not enough in his career, he's also a retired colonel from the U.S. Air Force and the Indiana Air National Guard with over 2,000 hours as a weapons systems officer in the F-4 Phantom II. Uh, it is a great pleasure to uh, introduce and welcome Dr. Richard Baker. At this point, I give him control of the session and allow him uh, to go through with his presentation. Thank you, Bill. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Richard Baker, and uh, today I'm going to talk about how unmanned and autonomous systems are being used in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. Um, our agenda today covers an introduction to set the background and the subject, and then we will cover the challenge, uh, the responses by unmanned aerial systems and some other unmanned ground vehicles. Uh, some of the examples will be in the early pandemic time and some are later as techniques and applications changed. Uh, lastly, I will talk a little about the future of unmanned and autonomous systems as an outgrowth of the pandemic response and then we will take some questions. Uh, the pandemic uh, in 2015 Jerry Kaplan, a uh, preeminent researcher at the Artificial Intelligence Lab and a fellow of the Center for Legal Informatics at Stanford University, predicted a dire future. He projected a time when restaurant and bar workers, wait staff, cooks, even dishwashers, and hotel staff cleaning rooms, making beds, folding laundry, and many small brick and mortar retail shops would be out of work. His premise was not, however, based on a pandemic. Instead, it was artificial intelligence and robotics. His premise included synthetic intelligence with mobile robotics to displace workers such as cooks, waiters, dishwashers, hotel staff, and many more. It also included the ability to order things on the internet directly from groceries or large distribution centers where they would be stocked, picked, and delivered via artificially intelligent robots. The picture on the top right is Paris, March 18th in 2020, at the onset of the lockdown because of the COVID-19 virus. The virus had already spread to most major cities throughout the world, and streets were almost empty, and cleaning crews began their uh, laborious job everywhere. Medical facilities were filling rapidly, and patients were dying. The lockdown was put in place to help stop the spread. Restaurants and bars, places where people gather, closed except for takeout. Hotels and anyone in the travel industry were impacted. Uh, airlines were losing millions of people, losing millions because people were not traveling. And only essential business and essential workers were cleared to go to work. Millions of businesses were impacted. Millions of people lost their jobs. And people turned to the internet to continue their work, to go to school to order groceries and other items, even to stay in touch with family and friends. Much of Kaplan's future had come to pass, but not because of artificially intelligent robots or unmanned and autonomous systems are now called. Uh, instead, it was COVID-19 pandemic. Instead, we turned to the unmanned and autonomous systems to help us fight it. Now the challenge the whole world was facing was new and unexpected. How do you continue to do the normal things everyone does when a highly contagious and deadly virus was spreading throughout the world? The virus was new and we did not know what we did not know about it yet. How contagious was it? Was it spread by human to human contact or could it be spread by, it, by the air or th through contact with items touched by someone with COVID-19? What was the safe distance from others? How could we spread? How, how could we contain the spread? So lockdowns were established and only essential workers went to work. Many businesses and organizations went on lockdown status like work remotely or not at all. Uh, schools went to e-learning. Many churches went online and, and so it went. Mask wearing was mandated and social distancing became an everyday thing. But still people were becoming sick with COVID and many were dying. How could the medical community support extremely contagious individuals when it was not supplied with the amount of personal protection equipment or, or PPE uh, that was now needed? Even travel was restricted, making it hard to get help from one region to another. 
Oops. Didn't go back. And the response came quickly as in innovative people and organizations sought to meet the challenge. A few companies quickly turned to using drones to make people's temperature, uh, to take people's temperatures as handheld thermometers became hard to acquire and drones can carry cameras and sensors to measure body temperature at a distance. And they can detect social distancing, uh, body temperature, heart rate, and even when you sneeze or cough. Uh, not surprisingly, some companies talked about using drones to help fight the spread of the virus directly, like spraying disinfectants on outdoor stadiums or scanning crowds for infected people using thermal imaging. But implementation of those ideas came a, a little later. Uh, COVID caught everyone by surprise, but there was an immediate move to accelerate drone adoption because drones are viewed as a perfect socially distant worker. They can collect data and share it with people who aren't present. For example, during the, the peak of the pandemic in China, uh, authorities were carrying out large scale remote temperature measurement in most apartment complexes through the use of drones. Since people were worried about catching the infection, to avoid the face-to-face -face contact, Chinese authorities used drones equipped with infrared cameras to measure the temperature of people who were locked down in their houses by having them stand in a window. At the University of South Australia, researchers were working on coronavirus detection drones capable of detecting temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, as well as detecting people sneezing and coughing in crowds. And the University of South Australia and Dragonfly, a Canadian company, uh, joined forces to create a coronavirus drone. It was dubbed the pandemic drone. That's the one shown here. The drone is fit, fitted with a specialized sensor and a computer vision system capable of detecting vital signs that are linked to having coronavirus. So far, the team has been able to accurately measure heart rate and breathing rate of people from a distance of five to 10 meters uh, up to 50 meters with a fixed camera. They can also detect sneezing and coughing. It might not detect all cases, but it could be a, a reliable tool to detect the presence of the disease in a place or a group of people. Now, rule enforcement during the pandemic, especially at the start, was an important policy for authorities around the globe to prevent the spread of the virus. They were taking unprecedented measures to reduce people to people contact. Uh, most countries took measures like the closure of non-essential public places, uh, a ban of mass gatherings and ensuring social distancing to limit the physical contact. However, in some areas where individuals were not complying with the restrictions knowingly or unknowingly or did not know what the latest restrictions were, Law enforcement such as the local police or municipal authorities were using drones to monitor people's movement and break up social gatherings that could pose a risk to society. And the introduction of drones at this time of crisis was reducing the risk of getting the police officials and other staff infected since it enables monitoring vast swaths of area without physical contact. Uh, in April, 2020, New Yorkers were strolling along the East River and glanced up to see an unsettling sight. It was a mysterious drone blurring messages to pedestrians below, such as, please maintain a social distance of at least six feet and please help stop the spread of the virus. Law enforcement officials in the cities and towns around the world have been using drones to scan parks, beaches, and city squares for violators that were wandering into the safe spaces of others. Drones have been working as police officers soaring over the banks of the Seine in Paris and the city squares of Mumbai and in cities in the U.S. to patrol for social distancing violators. In Italy, police were using drones to check on residents who have actually tested for COVID-19. In India, police were using drones to track large gatherings and monitor narrow roads that police cars couldn't get to. In France, Health warnings are blared through the drones flying over deserted beaches and a company called Surf Life Saving Operations in New South Wales used its drones to monitor the Sydney beaches to make sure uh, people were following COVID, the COVID guidelines. Uh, the drones took to the sky and, and are expected to be used until further notice. So 
medical uh, medical supply delivery was technology transforming industries and in on a global scale with the COVID-19 pandemic presenting a huge opportunity for medical practitioners and policymakers to test new ways in which technology like unmanned aerial systems, um, telemedicine, AI, big data analytics, cloud computing and mobility can facilitate healthcare systems to meet the challenge. An example of this is Zipline, a South uh, San Francisco based startup founded in 2014 that distributes medical supplies to healthcare workers in Africa and all over the world. That drone company uh, plans to begin transporting COVID-19 vaccines in April uh, this year. The company said that it is partnering with a leading manufacturer of COVID-19 vaccines. They didn't say who it was. In all the markets where its drones currently operate, Zipline airdrops medical supplies and ferries tests from more than 1,000 hospitals in Ghana and Rwanda, Rwanda by, uh, by drone and replacing the need for face-to-face -face contact. In late 2020, they began delivering personal protective equipment to hospitals and clinics in North Carolina, and they plan to adopt uh, operations in Nigeria later this year. Their fixed wing battery powered drones drop payloads of a few pounds each uh, by parachute, and they can fly up to 100 miles round trip. A uh, single distribution site can operate dozens of drones and supply an area of up to 8,000 square miles, they say. The company says its drones have flown more than 4 million miles and made nearly 400,000 deliveries in the past few years. Back in uh, mid-2019, a company called Swoop Arrow began working with the government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, to begin delivering vaccines to remote villages using drones. Uh, 50 flights spanning over 1,243 miles delivered 55 pounds each of uh, communication or immunization products, medicines, and medical supplies within five days of being operational. Swoop Arrow isn't the only uh, uh, company out there doing that, and they're not new to the drone medical deliveries. They've been working with remote villages in Africa to deliver blood samples to hospitals and helping fight things like measles, tuberculosis, and HIV, among other things, uh, for quite a while. Uh, Swoop Arrows drones can complete round trips of around 162 miles, and they can carry up to 10 coronavirus test kits or up to 50 vials of blood. The drones have a wingspan of nearly eight feet and are required to fly below 400 feet to ensure they don't collide with crewed aircraft. And the flights cost around $6.45 or $9 to, to uh, $9.67 uh, US, which is significantly cheaper than uh, a crewed transport over such a large distance. In Mexico, uh, Sincrona Logistica, a Mexico City-based pharmaceutical and logistics company has been using drones to deliver face masks to Mexican hospitals to remove the risk of human-to-human -human transmission of COVID. And the drones have also been delivering medical safety equipment, antibacterial gel, gloves, 3D printed face shields, and other supplies to healthcare workers in the front line to hospitals in the central states of Mexico. In, 20, uh, in July 2020, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, representatives for a national health service in the UK reached out to York-based drone company Flyby Technology and their partner Skylift UAV with an idea. They wanted to deploy drones to deliver live COVID-19 samples from hospitals and test sites to laboratories in support of the National Health Service Test and Trace filling a logistical gap to get tests processed faster. Typically, COVID-19 test samples are delivered via motorbikes and cars, but they were just not getting to the large testing machines fast enough to meet the demand. So UAS helped fill in the gaps, delivering tests every half hour to keep the machines full. Drone delivery company Flirty, the one shown here, has announced it will work with Vault Health to deliver at uh, at home COVID-19 tests 
to limit exposure between people and make it more convenient for those far away from test locations. Last November, the two companies announced uh, a partnership that's seen uh, drones delivering COVID-19 test kits to residents not wanting to leave their homes in Reno, Nevada, and they've done quite a bit there. Flirty's Eagle drone, that's the one shown here, uh, delivered the test kits and their uh, drone has been designed to fly in 95% of weather conditions, which is a large uh, accomplishment for drones. Like uh, wing aviation's design, the Flirty Eagle also uses a tether to lower the package at the drop-off location. Once the drone dropped off the test kit, the receiving individuals join a video call with a health professional to ensure the test is taken correctly. Then the test is given 48 to 72 hours to come up with a result, at which time the individual hops back on a call to discuss the result. Zipline, a California-based drone startup that delivers critical medical supplies in countries like Ghana and Rwanda is pursuing a larger role in the COVID-19 global vaccine effort and taking on the trickiest logistical challenges, the cold chain storage. Nigeria's Kaduna state signed a, a deal with Zipline, allowing the, um, the drone delivery of COVID-19 vaccines. Kaduna's partnership with Zipline, which delivered more than a million doses of other vaccines in Africa over the past year, will also enable on-demand on delivery of blood products, medications, and other vaccines. The deal with Kaduna did not include uh, cold chain storage, but separately, Zipline is working on a plan to distribute the vaccines with end-to-end -end cold, cha cold chain capabilities. Pfizer's vaccine needs to be stored in uh, ultra cold freezers that keep it between negative 112 and negative 75 or 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Other COVID-19 vaccines such as those developed by Moderna and Oxford AstraZeneca can be stored at a less extreme temperatures, but this provides a problem. Uh, the ultra cold temperatures required for storing the COVID-19 vaccine developed by Pfizer and uh, BioNTech has not only driven a, a buying frenzy for freezers and dry ice, but also created a log logistical challenges for cash strapped medical facilities that may not be able to afford such equipment. Cold chain distribution in pharmaceuticals is complicated, even in normal times. You have a clock ticking, you have expiration date, you have multiple modes of transportation, multiple handoffs from the manufacturer all the way to the administration of the actual vaccine. The good news is that public and private industry are all coming together to be part of the solution through more capacity and new digital capabilities, including the use of drones. Uh, in the United States and Africa, Zipline will add ultra low refrigeration capacity at, at its distribution centers and conduct end to end thermal validation from the point of pickup to the patient, according to uh, what they've said so far. The next thing was how do we eliminate the virus? Over the past year, Experts have discovered that coronavirus is mainly transmitted by touching contaminated surfaces. And this new virus is shown to be very contagious and resistant, sometimes staying on some surfaces up to 30 days, which makes disinfectant spray vital to helping reduce transmission mechanisms. To disinfect public spaces such as sports stadiums and gathering areas and parks or city centers and prevent the further spread of COVID-19, Health authorities are deploying agriculture spray drones to carry out tasks like spraying disinfectant in potentially affected areas. These spraying drones are filled with spraying dis with disinfectants and can cover much more ground in less time and 50 times faster than traditional methods. Uh, according to DJI, uh, uh, one of the world's most popular drone makers, a uh, spraying UAV can carry around four gallons of disinfectant and cover a 300,000 square feet area in an hour. These drones are easy to operate and expensive and can be quickly mobilized in addition to reducing the risk of health and sanit the risk to health and sanitation workers um, to, to both the virus and the disinfectant. In addition to China, countries like India, Indonesia, Philippines, 
Colombia, Chile, and the UAE have successfully used disinfecting drones to control the spread of the virus. In Europe, Spain was the first country to use agricultural drones for disinfecting large public areas. And several startups like Quaternium, Drone Tools, Mana Aero, and uh, in the US and Canada, companies like Zipline, Flirty, and Dragonfly are all exploring how they can help in their regions and neighboring countries to decrease the aftermath of the pandemic and save more lives with the spray. Quaternium has successfully been testing its hybrid drone, Hybrix, to spray um, and disinfect the products in Spain, showing how drone technology may serve in critical situations and how the company can support public authorities to help end the virus. Recently, uh, Wing Aviation's head of Australian operations in Brisbane shared how the company kept busy during the lockdown period by providing delivery service for retail business. For now, uh, in Brisbane, Nine businesses are delivering with Wing, including a coffee shop, a grocery store, a hardware store, a sushi restaurant, and a golf store. Uh, the benefit of having a wide range of businesses linked to a delivery services means that the majority of goods needed for day-to-day -day life can be delivered by drones. You can get, you can get groceries and the all-important toilet paper from the grocery store while still getting, t uh, while still being stuck in the lockdown. Uh, Wing saw an increase in a demand of five times in May 2020 compared to the previous month. During this period, the company also gained hundreds of new users, providing more business to, to uh, Wing and more importantly, to local businesses using the drone delivery network. Non-medical deliveries have also gone up in popularity with the Wing Aviation seeing around a 350% increase month to month. Uh, Wing Aviation currently makes deliveries of small food items and medications from a chemist in uh, Logan, Australia. And in the U.S., a Wing is working with FedEx to deliver packages from Walgreens, a few bakeries, and a retailer. Uh, these deliveries allow for at-risk people who do not have the, the to leave their home from the safety and uh, get their essentials. On an interesting note, a Chinese car company called Geely announced in March 2020, it would compete uh, 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 with uh, new, new car sales by uh, online deliveries using delivery drones to ensure human to human contact was avoided. And uh, the new owners were able to receive their car keys via a delivery drone that dropped them right off at their door. The cars were sprayed with, sprayed with disinfectant, put on the back of a truck and delivered to the customer's homes. And then the drone was sent with the keys and flown directly to the customer. And the customer was free to hop in and start driving. But this is all, the use of drones not all been smooth and conflict free. There have been some pushbacks, resistance, uh, even uh, protests. In France, uh, authorities have faced multiple setbacks over privacy concerns since the pandemic began. Last summer, the Parisian uh, Transport Authority uh, suspended an effort that used uh, artificial intelligence technology to monitor whether Metro riders were wearing masks. Uh, France's privacy watchdog had criticized the argument, uh, arguing that it uh, risked a feeling of general surveillance among the citizens and it could undermine the proper functioning of their de democratic society. The activists feared that uh, drone monitoring could serve as a trial run for more expansive surveillance programs and uh, a, a legal challenge and a ruling by France's largest court in May 2020 uh, suspended the practices in Paris. Civil rights groups have pushed back against the use of technology, saying some of its capabilities are invasive and pose constitutional dangers. These include the ability to detect someone's body temperature from a distance. Uh, civil rights and uh, pri privacy advocates, uh, this amounts to, to an indiscriminate warrantless search. So like obtaining the uh, private health information of people who did not give consent and aren't under criminal investigation. And others worry when uh, monitoring would stop. So when the COVID is gone and people are healthy, uh, there is a fear that drones will be flying around watching people. And of course, the idea of government eye in the sky doesn't always play well in the United States. Uh, personal liberty here is a founding precept, you know, and taken very seriously.
Uh, every disaster is different, but the experience of using robots for the COVID-19 pandemic um, presents an opportunity to fully f learn three lessons documented over the past 20 years. One important lesson is that during a disaster, mobile robots do not replace people. They either perform tasks that a person can cannot do or cannot do safely, or take on tasks that free up responders to uh, handle the increased workload. The majority of robots being used in hospitals treating COVID-19 patients have not replaced healthcare professionals. These robots are teleoperated, enabling the healthcare workers to apply their expertise and their compassion to sick and isolate, isolated patients remotely. A uh, small number of robots are autonomous, such as the um, popular Danish company Blue Ocean's UVD decontamination robots and meal and prescription robot carts. But the reports indicate the robots are not displacing workers. Instead, they are helping uh, the existing hospital staff cope with the surge in infectious patients. The decontamination robots disinfect faster and better than human uh, the better than human cleaners, while the robotic carts reduce the amount of time and personal protective equipment that nurses and aides must spend on uh, ancillary care. Blue Ocean's UVD units operate in more than 40 countries in Asia, Europe, and the United States. UVD uses ultraviolet light, the UVC, to, uh, to kill harmful microorganisms. The robot's the current holder of the uh, Innovation and Entrepreneurship in Robotics and Automation Award by the uh, IEEE and the International Foundation, or uh, Federation rather, of uh, Robotics. The uh, immediate demand for the UVD units increased tremendously with the outbreak of the uh, COVID-19. Existing customers bought more units than ever before, and many new customers were ordering the UVD robots to fight cor coronavirus, cor excuse me, coronavirus and harmful microorganisms. This is an ongoing success story for uh, Blue Ocean Robotics based in Denmark, who has seen a growth in sales of more than 400%. The Danish robot moves autonomously around patient rooms and operating rooms, covering all the critical surfaces with the right amount of UV light in order to kill the specific viruses and bacteria. And the more light the robot exposes to a surface, the more harmful microorganisms are destroyed. In a typical patient room, 99.99% of all viruses and bacteria are killed within 10 minutes. It is a supplementary device which assists the cleaning staff. It does not replace them. For safety reasons, it works on its own with no humans in the room and automatically disengages the UV light if someone enters the room. Uh, the robot can be used in various enclosed places, not only in hospitals, but also office spaces, shopping malls, schools, airports, and production facilities, as long as people aren't in the room. In hospitals, doctors and nurses, family members, and even receptionists are using robots to interact in real time with patients from a safe distance. Specialized robots are disinfecting rooms and delivering meals or prescriptions, handling the extra uh, work associated with surge in patients. Delivery robots are transporting infectious samples to the laboratories for testing. Uh, robots aren't good at everything. Uh, it's figuring out how they're what they are good at and getting them there without disrupting the workflow of the healthcare providers. If in the future we begin to rely more on robots interacting with the patients, it's important to remember that people also need a human touch and connection during their recovery. But if you do have to put a robot in there, it's important that the robot fits in with the social signals that we do as humans. Uh, robot-like technology backed with a human face help provide care for the first patient in the U.S. to be diagnosed with the COVID-19 virus. The 35-year-old man who had recently returned from Wuhan, China, was treated in late January 2020 at the Providence Regional Health Center in Everett, Washington. Uh, the hospital had procured both internally and from an outside company carts with high-end audio and visual connections that allowed doctors and nurses to communicate remotely with this first patient and subsequent others.
Uh, the carts are also equipped with digital stethoscope and other tools to assist the medical team. Uh, the technology has not replaced in-person care, uh, but it has reduced the number of times the medical staff need to enter the patient's room, which means they can conserve uh, something that's really in short supply, and that's the PPE equipment by as much as 50%. Now more, more recently, robots are being used for essential functions in the patient care setting, like take for example, Moxie, which is built by the Texas-based Diligent Robotics. Moxie works full-time and delivers personal protective equipment, uh, coronavirus and other lab samples and COVID-19 tests. It picks up and delivers anything dropped off for patients to be delivered to them. And it reports how the pandemic moxie has become even more essential to the part of the team that's the healthcare providers. The day-to-day -day work in the hospitals change where patients are located and what supplies are needed to get there. Moxie carries things from place to place and there, so there are fewer people moving around in spaces. Uh, one of the hospitals in Dallas, Texas, Moxie delivered over 4,000 items of PPE throughout the month. And, uh, and every one of those is something that a, pers uh, a person in healthcare or a nurse did not have to run down to another unit to grab. Doctors and nurses and other health care workers form the front line against the pandemics. And not only are they treated needed to treat the uh, sick patients, but they also put themselves at high risk by contracting the disease, disease themselves. In COVID-19 outbreak, thousands of doctors and um, nurses have fallen ill and hundreds have died. These risks become even more hazardous when shortages of PPE equipment leave healthcare workers with no uh, alternative but to reuse or improvise. Um, and Moxie is helping to address this severe issue. The COVID-19 pandemic then accelerated an existing shift from brick and mortar re retail to e-commerce, particularly for consumer-based uh, goods and groceries. Growth expected over the next three to five years occur occurred over the past six months. In the first few months of 2020, supply chains were strained by the demand for personal protective equipment, such as face masks, and they're now gearing up for the distribution of vaccines. Hospital ch supply chains are subject to shifting demands like those in retail. The need to respond to such demands has led to expectations of growth in robotics for pick and place, materials handling, delivery applications, vendors of mobile robots, automated storage and retrieval systems, and last mile delivery vehicles in the air and on the ground have been uh, huge demand. Uh, and Milton Keynes, uh, Milton Keynes, the UK, a recently expanded fleet of six wheel robots has been delivering food and small supermarket shopping consignments to a hungry resident residents. The, the town's large network of cycle paths makes it ideally suited to the knee-high machines, which is the one shown on the, uh, the bottom there, um, and that travels at a top speed of four miles an hour. In Singapore, uh, park goers have been reminded of their social distancing obligations by Boston Dynamics Yellow Dog. Uh, this robot hound is equipped with numerous cameras and sensors, which it uh, can use to detect transgressors and broadcast pre-recorded warnings. The authorities have reassured uh, uh, locals it is not a quadruped uh, data collection device. Um, and in Hollywood, Dragonflies announced it's working with Enderby Entertainment to speed up the reopening of Hollywood and uh, filmmaking amid the uh, outbreak using its safe set selection solutions on a ground based technology. Um, they'll be distributing the system and it's already planned to purchase and implement a safe set system in upcoming productions in the Hollywood area um, to keep the, the, the film industry going. And in telepresence, that's an, another opportunity. In Japan, uh, Omni Labs 
NUMI robots have been used to substitute for quarantine students who are unavailable to attend their graduation ceremonies. Uh, telepresence robots, which had a computer tablet for a head, uh, were draped in an, in an academic gown, and each student made a Zoom call to receive their degree from a university official. A similar ceremony using robots built by students has been held in Nanjing, China, and are other places. Um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the trend toward increased use of robotics and telemedicine in healthcare is accelerating. Both, tele both technologies have the potential to aid in social distancing, which reduces the rate of healthcare acquired infections for patients and for personnel. And telenursing is the idea that a human, a human nurse can remotely control a robot to perform most or many of the tasks involved in patient care. In other words, the robot becomes the nurse's eyes, ears, and body. And the mobile telepresence of robots and video screens and touchscreen interfaces have been Italy, adopted in Italy uh, to let healthcare workers check on patients without physically entering the quarantine room. So the future. What does it hold? Just as uh, World War II hurried the development of emerging technologies like computers, uh, rocketry, jet aircraft, and atomic energy, the pandemic may speed the development and the adoption of drone technology. Major world events can alter technological development cycles, causing them to accelerate or slow down. We're seeing that now with drones and other automation in response to the pandemic. There's a push to develop new tools that can reduce people's exposure to the virus. What can we auto automate and by how much? The University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana and Duke University are immersed in development of a prototype telenursing robot called the Telerobotic Intelligent Nursing Assistant or Trina. That's the top left picture. Originally sponsored by the National Science Foundation in response to the 2014 Ebola outbreak, Trina is a mobile manipulation robot with telepresence capabilities and it's designed to let medical staff perform a variety of routine tasks such as bringing food and medicine, moving equipment, cleaning, monitoring vital signs uh, while communicating with the patient. They tested the Trina platform over hundreds of hours in labs and simulated clinical tests. And there are now three versions of Trina in operation. The original at, is at Duke University, a second at Worcester Polytechnic Institute and Trina 2.0, which is the one in the lower right, uh, is currently in development at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. Humans sometimes regard robots with apprehension or resentment over the increasing automation of labor, but coronavirus pandemic is showing how the two can work together in new ways that can save lives during a crisis. Around the globe, robots and other technologies like drones and telehealth devices are being used in a variety of settings and cap capacities to assist in COVID-19 response since there's a level of elevated risk for human workers. So in the COVID-19 pandemic has caused thousands of deaths and infected millions of people worldwide and it's made us rethink how governments, organizations, schools, societies around the world can work with minimum or without physical contact. I've talked a lot about UAVs in other countries and not so much in the US, but let me assure you, they were in use here too. But many other countries were already using uh, we're already working closely with their equivalent of the Federal Aviation Administration and had obtained permission to fly in their airspace. Uh, it's much easier when your country is largely rural and the pandemic quickly caught the attention of the FAA and they've been working faster now, um, not cutting corners, but to review and approve new requests for delivery and spraying missions. Today, the frontline warriors and heroes of the nation are the doctors and the medical staff local police, private security guards, refuse collectors even. Technologies like artificial intelligence, big data, uh, GIS and mapping, um, location technology and unmanned and autonomous systems are playing a growing role in responding to the pandemic. However, this fight against the invisible enemy 
Uh, drones play a key role by helping authorities and people in different ways to prevent further spread of the coronavirus outbreak. Unmanned solutions are easy to operate and can be quickly automated. Uh, they've delivered meals to quarantine delivers and uh, quarantine travelers in Chinese hotels and forced curfews in Tunisia, uh, scan visitors for fevers entering a South Korean hospital, monitored patients in a hard hit Italian city, and track social distancing compliance within uh, a number of cities around the world, including Elizabeth, New Jersey, and many others. Automation is not particularly exciting, but just like the unglamorous disinfecting robots in use now, it's a valuable application. If government and industry have finally learned the lessons from previous disasters, more drones and robots will be ready to work side by side with the healthcare workers in the front lines and when the next pandemic arrives. I think that's back to you, Bill. It is. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your presentation, Dr. Baker. Now, uh, let me remind everyone that the way we're asking, uh, getting questions answered is through the text chat. So take the time now to type in your question. And uh, we have plenty of time. We're right on schedule. We'll be happy to take any questions that come on or comments because some of you are um, in this field already and would like to uh, share your expertise with the group. So put that into the text chat. Now, while we wait there, I wanted to make two comments. One, um, as I said earlier, I'm based in Austin, Texas. And, and uh, of course, we've been impacted by the pandemic as everyone else has. But we've also been impacted by terrible weather with two ice storms and six inches of snow that basically ground everything to a halt. And I was just thinking about uh, that uh, experience you're talking about in Brisbane, Australia, where they're delivering groceries by uh, by uh, uh, drones that uh, I would have gladly paid uh, to have that uh, done here in our area. And I hope that we will see that. I also wanted to mention that um, you mentioned Milton Keynes in England, and uh, you said the word that there were multiple uh, cycle paths and uh, around there that that uh, that uh, the UAS could uh, what I heard you say was that there were multiple psychopaths, uh, which is not quite the same. I just found that interesting. Um, what uh, my selective hearing there. Now I'm looking for questions. Are there any questions? Uh, okay, here's a question. Um, uh, Gregory says, how is Capital Technology preparing their students during the pandemic in the robotics course? I'm not sure that Dr. Baker can answer that, but I'll let him give him a stab. Uh, I'm not sure about the robotics course, but I'm thinking that they're doing things online. Um, we have a virtual lab in the computer science area, I'm sure, and I think we're doing the same thing with our lab in the unmanned systems. Uh, so in the robotics, I am not sure, but we are adapting quickly. Uh, that's one of the things we've had to learn and is how do we prepare our students in a way that they can work with, with laboratory, be able to do the robotics and do things like that at the same time. We do have other faculty and staff members that have joined us for this presentation. So if any of you have um, uh, something um, uh, having to do with that question, feel free to chime in through the text chat. Gary asks, um, excuse me, I'll start with Ian. What is needed for confidence in flying beyond the visual line of sight to maximize um, UAS drone use? Uh, what is needed for confidence to fly beyond the visual line of sight? Um, mostly the ability to have the uh, communications beyond there. Um, that's been a, a large restriction for the small UAS because of the uh, connectivity. Um, as far as uh, there's a lot of development going on and some of these organizations I talked about today have already done a lot of work in an area where they can go beyond line of sight. Um, because uh, they've been working with the uh, equivalents of the FAA in that area. Uh, shown that they can be tested and flown safely. And they've been delivering products for, uh, in some of these uh, pr uh, companies for uh, the last five years in places like Africa and Australia. 
You raise a good point. I believe that uh, uh, some of the drawbacks that we've seen in the United States is because of the reluctance for um, the FAA to um, pursue uh, being, being going beyond the visual line of sight and other countries, as you mentioned, are more rural and have more freedom in that area and more necessity for it. But the FAA is, of course, coming along very quickly. Now, uh, let's see here. Uh, Gary asks, how has uh, aerospace industry uh, technology transfer aided in the U.S. UASs at this time? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question as far as transfer uh, and, and UAS. Gary, Gary, can you give me a little more information? Okay, he's typing in and we'll uh, go on to the next question while Gary's typing. Let me scroll back up here to the question from Eric. Um, where do you feel the key challenges are in expanding the role of UAS in the commercial delivery industry in heavily populated areas? I think the largest uh, challenge in the, for commercial growth in highly populated areas is the ability to show that the drones can fly safely over people and uh, houses and so on where people are uh, over populated areas so that um, there's, there's not a problem with them falling or dropping uh, their cargo or that sort of thing. Uh, the biggest thing is just showing them that they can do it safely and fly over those populated areas without danger to the people below. All right, thank you. Uh, Eric adds a, a second unrelated question, but a very interesting one given uh, what we saw in the news yesterday about the Mars landing. Given the lower atmospheric densities, any thoughts on drone use efficiencies in future Mars missions? Yes, as a matter of fact, there is... Uh, uh, one of the companies, a Dragonfly or um, Flirty or someone that uh, it's a, uses a uh, quadcopter, and they are working with NASA to come up with a drone that will actually work there. And I know that work is going on because I saw the presentation by NASA on uh, Tuesday before the landing. I know that uh, they they're using some sort of. Uh helicopter apparatus right now as part of the um, uh, mission. And uh, that's an intriguing question, Eric. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Uh, Lisa mentioned or asked, can you speak again to aerial spraying? And I'm assuming that she's referring to aerial spraying of disinfectant, but it might be agricultural. Okay. One of the problems in the United States, and I'll talk about that specifically, is that aerial spraying has not been allowed until just the last couple of years. Um, and that was one of the rules of the FAA was that things could not be sprayed from a, a UAS. Uh, however, after some research done out in California and some proof with uh, uh, over time frame showing some tests and the ability that it would work and it could be done safely um, within the weight restrictions and so on, uh, that's been able to be worked out and they're able to do that. But you have to have the uh, approval from the FAA for your particular mission to be able to do spray. Does that answer your question? We'll have to wait and see uh, as they type it in here. Now, uh, there are two questions that came up with cybersecurity. I will mention them. I would like to just put a, a little commercial out real quick. Let me go ahead to this uh, since we're talking about it. Is uh, right, oh, I went too far, I'm sorry. Let me get back to that. Uh, next month on March 19th, we have a cyber terrorism um, webinar with Paul D'Souza. I encourage you to sign up for that if you've not done so already. We'll come back and talk about these upcoming webinars, but I wanted to mention that now both to Andre and to George. Um, Andre's question is, um, what is the impact uh, to Capital Technology Cybersecurity Doctoral Program? The rise of automation and autonomous systems present a new threat and possibly a new or modified method of study. And he says that he's expecting to enter the program in the fall. And uh, welcome to uh, the doctoral program, Andre. But um, um, so how, how does um, uh, autonomous systems, how, are, how will they be in, impacted by cybersecurity issues? 
Uh, autonomous systems can be impacted tremendously by cybersecurity issues, and that's one of our greatest uh, fears, is that an autonomous system might be hacked and taken over by someone else, or uh, simply hacked and the uh, data that's uh, t gathered be taken over by someone else. Um, the, the, our worst fear, of course, is always that someone hack it, take it over, and whether it's a ground drone or a water drone or an air drone that um, they, they could do something else with it that it's not meant to do. So uh, it's a very real fear. And as a matter of fact, we have a degree in uh, the Master of Science in uh, cybersecurity for unmanned systems. So that's one of the ways we're addressing it. Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up about that new degree. I wanted to mention to everybody that we actually offer um, unmanned systems uh, degrees at the bachelor's level, the master's level, and at the uh, doctoral level. We also offer cybersecurity degrees in each of those at each of those levels, and the ability to combine many of those uh, studies or disciplines together, as uh, Dr. Baker has just mentioned. Okay, now I'll come back to Gary's question, which is. Um, um, Technology used on the current Mars mission, do you know of any of that kind of technology that's making its way over to private industry? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure there will be, but at this point right now, I'm not sure of any specific technology that's making its way over. I, um, I'm just not up to speed on it, I'm sorry. Right, I, um, the, um, that is such an emerging field. Uh, with uh, what we're learning from the Mars mission. And, and I think that there's still time will tell on that. Uh, the last question that we have right now, and I'm looking at the clock, so we need to stop with that is uh, George Lawless had uh, mentioned, ask if uh, Capital Tech will have a virtual test lab like offensive security Kali to protect against hackers going after hospitals. Uh, George, I think we'll delay that answer to that question and maybe we will pose it again next week since that's uh, moves uh, directly into the cyber world. Um, and I don't want to stretch Dr. Baker too far. He knows a lot of things about a lot of things, but uh, I don't know that he knows everything about that. <laughs> okay, and and we're running out of time. If you do, go ahead, Dr. Baker. Uh, you, no, you I, I know okay. that's not my area. That's really uh, Bill Butler's with the cyber, so yeah. <laughs> wait for oh, okay. <laughs> so wait till next month. Okay. Now uh, I've had I've left up the slide for the upcoming webinars. I need to go over them quickly. We we like to end these right at the top of the hour. Uh, cybersecurity, March nineteenth. Applied artificial intelligence uh, with Dr. Robert Steele uh, on April sixteenth. The future of technology and education with Hayden Land, who is the chair of our board of trustees and an expert in technology on April 30th. So we have three webinars coming up in the next uh, a couple of months. I encourage you and more. There's actually webinars that will be held in May and June as well. But uh, if you are interested in pursuing uh, attendance at any of those, uh, here's the website. Uh, it's the same website that you've used to uh, check into this one. So just uh, uh, look for it. Now, let me um, let me move ahead to the last slide, uh, almost the last slide. I have one after this. A copy of the slides and a link to the recording is going to be sent to all registrants. That includes those who attended the live session just now, as well as those who will watch it on demand. Uh, a certificate of completion is available upon request. All you have to do is reply to the email. When I send you out the uh, email with the link to the recording and the slides, just respond back to me and say, hey, Bill, I want a certificate of completion. I'll be happy to send you one. Now, with that, that does conclude today's webinar and we are right at the top of the hour. So thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to particularly thank Dr. Baker uh, for this very interesting talk. Uh, and um, uh, I, I see uh, that this world is exploding in the area and much deeper and much broader than just simply drones as everyone thinks about but the implications in the medical world, in the delivery world, and in many other areas, uh, amazing. And the implications for pri privacy and security <laughs> are interesting as well. With that, watch for a follow-up email, how to get a participation certificate, uh, and we'll send you a link to the recording and a link to the slides. Thank you very much for joining us. I look forward to our time.
time together next month. And with this, we are officially done and you may log out. And again, our, my thanks to everyone joining us today for this great se uh, session. Thank you, Bill. You're very welcome.